to have a look at the latter day Assyrian, but in the context of ancient times types of future events. And it is our intention to uh, consider this uh, subject in a particular way. It is, after all, a prophecy day. So what we would like to do is to look at some of the prophecies that relate to Assyria in the Old Testament, to examine how they had an application to the events that, uh, that, were, that they were uh, immediately designed to address, and then to look how they apply them to the latter days. And sharing together that chapter in uh, the prophecy through Micah, we have a, a, a good example of that, when we see there that uh, the Assyrian is uh, talking, talked of in the context of the latter days. Because we have there in the, the verse uh, 2, the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the he of the chapter going through is undoubtedly the Lord Jesus Christ. And he, it's said of him in, um, in verse 5 that this man shall be our peace uh, when the Assyrian shall come into our, la our land. So we're on good grounds to look for a, a fulfillment of such prophecies in the latter days of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's the basis on which we, 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 we try and address our remarks and it is with a great uh, sense of inadequacy that we do so because the sheer volume of prophecy in the Old Testament and the history of the Old Testament that relates to Assyria is considerable. And so in the brief time that we have available to consider these things together this morning, it is going to be a very much a, 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 an overview of some of the relevant prophecies to glean from them the essential events that they were predicting. And what we'd like to do to provide a framework for our consideration is first to reflect upon the history of Assyria in the, uh, in, in the Bible, rather than its secular history, to look then at the, uh, how Assyria uh, features in Bible prophecy, and then to uh, home in on the latter-day Assyrian and the uh, situation which uh, is predicted to come to pass at the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, when that those number of events that are around the time of his, um, his second coming. But most importantly, we, uh, we then come to the, 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 the uh, part of our dress where we look at these things and see that they are indeed uh, lessons for us today. So let's just think of Assyria in uh, Bible history. And uh, we find Assyria mentioned at the very start of our scriptures where Assyria is a, 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 a place which is talked of even in the second chapter of Genesis. But more appropriately, we find the history of Assyria and the Assyrian peoples being put forward to us in the 10th chapter of the book of Genesis. And this is in relation to the, uh, 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 the, the man Nimrod and his relation to Assyria. But more particularly, we see in verse 22 of chapter 10 that uh, uh, Asher, the uh, progenitor of uh, Assyria was of the children of, of Shem. We're talking about a, 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 a Semitic race here uh, in the Bible history. Whereas Nimrod, on the other hand, was not of the uh, children of Shem, but was of the children of Ham. And it is said of him that the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and we associated him with Babylon. And out of that land, the revised version has it, that he went forth into Assyria and built it, built Nineveh. So it seems as though the, the people of Assyria were overcome by Nimrod, and he built Babylon in that uh, area. And when we go through the scriptures, we see how that, um, it, in some cases, the scriptures refer to Assyria, and we have it in the chapter that we've um, before us now, in uh, verse 6 of chapter 5, laid waste this land of Assyria with a sword, and the land of Nimrod in the entrances thereof. And we are talking of one and the same area of the globe. Um, and there's another confusion on some occasions in scripture because when Babylon is referred to, uh, in some cases it, well, it is Assyria that is being referred to in the, the prophecies and the historical records. For example, in the time in which uh, Manasseh was uh, uh, overcome and bound in fetters, he was carried to Babylon. But Babylon was ruled over by the Assyrians and was part of the Assyrian Empire at that time. And Ezahadan, uh, one of the Assyrian rulers, the history tells us that he, he actually uh, sat in court in uh, Babylon occasions. So just to get a, a, a bit of a picture now of the background to Assyria. And the other relevant fact that we want to take from this is that the meaning of the word Assyria is, is actually blessed. And it is significant always to look at the names of peoples and nations and so we have here a nation who, from the outset, 
are described by the inspired scriptures as blessed. And we're going to reflect on that before we close. Just to remind ourselves of the extent of the Assyrian Empire, we see how that it had spread out and uh, in its, uh, at its peak towards the end of its days, actually, it uh, covered not only the uh, lands uh, around uh, uh, Israel to the north of, but uh, it covered uh, Egypt. It uh, went uh, eastwards from its source into what is today Iraq, but also went further to the east and uh, covered most of the uh, area of Iran today. So that's what, what, what we've got, and that was um, the area that uh, Nimrod, perhaps, or parts of it, he ruled over uh, when he overcame the, 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 the children of uh, uh, Shem, which lived there in the first part, and perhaps his uh, 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 empires took a similar course, although perhaps not to the same extent as we have here on the screen. So as far as the Syrian Bible history is concerned, we've learned that it was a nation who is uh, perhaps seen to be predicted as being blessed by God in some way. Was taken by Nimrod, was one who rebelled against God after his, uh, his establishment of alternative worship in the uh, Tower of Babel, and he was a man who persecuted God's people. And the, uh, the blessings of uh, Assyria are perhaps emphasized us when we consider the, uh, the efforts of Jonah, who went to Nineveh to preach God to the people. So God had a continuing uh, care for the people of Assyria. So that's as far as we want to look at the, the Bible history and background to Assyria. So we now embark upon our consideration of the prophecies. And just to get a timeline on that, we look at the Assyrian Empire and the uh, parameters that we have for its rulership over the, 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 the ancient world. And we can see on that the various uh, uh, kings and rulers that were there over the land of Assyria. And we see how that the kingdom of Assyria uh, was there at the time of the, uh, 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 the, the reign of kings such as Ahaz up to Hezekiah. And we're all aware of the defeat of the Assyrians by God in the days of Hezekiah. But as we go further for, forward from that, we see that the Assyrian Empire did not stop there. It actually had a resurgence and continued to be a major power in world events some years after. And we can see there the, the, the way in which uh, uh, the rulership of the Assyrians over that area uh, spanned a great deal of uh, time in the centuries to which it related. And in so doing, it was there and contemporary with a number of the Old Testament prophets. So if we think of the prophecies that we have of Assyria, and as we've said already, there are very many of them. Just to give a picture of the sorts of things that the prophets are talking about. The Assyrians are seen uh, by the prophets as a means by which God brings his judgments upon the people of Israel, his people. And that was true both of the northern kingdom of Israel who were taken into captivity by the Assyrians, and also the people of Judah who suffered in the days of Hezekiah. But there are a number of prophecies which talk of the uh, deliverance of the people, the people of, we will term Israel, the, the Jews, rather than the, uh, the separation of Israel from Judah. The uh, deliverance of, the, uh, of, the, of Israel from the Egyptian uh, hosts. And there are predictions then of the captives that the Assyrians had taken being re returning to the land of Israel itself. And the last, then, we have some evidence within the scriptures that uh, uh, Assyria would be involved in the blessings that the prophets foresaw to be in the land. So that's a, an overview, really, of some of the scriptures that, that are there that concern Assyria and the, what the prophets saw concerning its future. Now, in interpreting these prophecies, we want to uh, look at it in a particular way. We, 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 we want to appreciate that some prophecies have more than one fulfillment. And certainly in the days of Micah, the prophecy in chapter 5 would have been a message to the people who were oppressed by Assyria. And as such, it would have a really, really, very real relevance to them as they saw probably people they knew being taken into captivity as the Assyrians came up against the land. So there was a, 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 a real relevance of these prophecies to the days to which they immediately related. 
But that's not to say that there were not principles then that would be fulfilled at a later time. And when we look at the prophecies, we will see that this is something that comes out strongly from our consideration of those prophecies. And quite relevant to quote some words that uh, were written by Brother Edward Whitaker concerning the interpretation of prophecy, where he said the first indispensable step is to discover what the prophecy would mean to those to whom it was first given. The local setting may then provide the pattern of the ultimate fulfillment. And that's reflected in our title, our theme for today, Types of Future Events. And perhaps the last thing to, 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 to appreciate is that when we look at prophecies and see how they work out, the prophecies that we have concerning events in the future need to be interpreted in a consistent way. And we know and uh, believe fervently that scripture is consistent, so the prophecy should be interpreted in that way. So let's just think then about the history of Assyria and Israel around the time of Hezekiah and the years before. Israel and Judah had sinned and uh, Assyria came up against the land. The first thing was that the northern kingdom fell and they were taken into captivity. Then uh, uh, the uh, Assyrian armies focused upon the land of Judah and many in Judah would have been taken captive by the Assyrians although the Assyrian onslaught faltered at the gates of Jerusalem because uh, the, uh, God's angel, after the prayers and intercession of Hezekiah, uh, God's one angel went out and 185 uh, uh, Assyrians died and the Jews spoiled the uh, uh, Assyrians and presumably with that, those armies died, many of those who had been taken captive in Judah were released from captivity. They were not taken away, taken into other lands, but they were released and returned to their, their homes. And the, the land was blessed, because after the defeat of the Assyrians in the reign of Hezekiah, we find that uh, it, the, the land uh, experienced a time of plenty. And not only that, but there were rulers who came up to Jerusalem to meet with Hezekiah. We remember the comments in the scriptures about the uh, ambassador from Babylon that came up to, 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 to see him. So that's a, a pattern of the historical events. And we can immediately say there that there may be parallels that are types of future events as far as the latter day Syrian is concerned. And to emphasize the soundness of that approach, we look at Hezekiah, and much has been written about the man, how he was a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there we have some of the elements that uh, immediately come out, and there are more in relation to Hezekiah as a type of the Lord Jesus. He, he was a child of promise, if you look go through the prophetic record. It is likely that being of the lineage of David, he was born in Bethlehem. He, he cleansed the temple, and we have a, a, a chapter in the historical record that relates to that. He made intercession and sacrifice for himself and for the people and suffered from a disease that typified a death. A death. Isaiah 53's primary application relates to the illness of Hezekiah. And so we see him as a, a type of the Lord Jesus Christ, a type of future events. It's recorded in the, what is it, uh, uh, spoken regarding him, that he went to the gates of the grave and was free of his uh, illness, his condition, on the third day. And there are strong parallels there, and again, good ground in seeing this, as types of future events, and associating the events of Hezekiah's life with the Lord Jesus Christ. But when we move on from that, we see that there are other events which could be seen to be an equal parallel with future events. The deceit of Assyria. It is, again, can be inferred from scripture that there was a year of jubilee and a year of, year of great plenty that occurred after that defeat. The captives return into the land. Our kings come into, into, into Jerusalem and his reign, which the remainder of that reign, the extension of his life was a reign predominantly of peace and prosperity. So we are, we're building a picture now which is uh, encouraging us that when we look at the prophecies, we look at it for the types of future events as well as the immediate relevance to the days in which the, uh, the primary application was to be fulfilled, the encouragement to the people of the day. And so, brothers and sisters, let's uh, spend a little bit of time now looking at the individual prophecies. Let's uh, go into the prophetic scriptures through the prophecy through Isaiah, 
and uh, uh, pick up a record relating to Assyria, which is contained for us in Isaiah chapter 7, and then to see how this fits in with the context in Isaiah, its relationship to the events around Hezekiah's day, and then the relationship to those events which were not fulfilled, but predicted by Isaiah, and that uh, uh, give us uh, uh, some information concerning latter day fulfillment. Uh, we, we, we enter the chapter in uh, verse 17, and we have our Assyria uh, referred to, and the Lord shall bring upon me and upon my people and upon their father's house days of them uh, have not come from the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, even the king of Assyria. And so we have a direct prophecy that the king of Assyria would come up to the land as we know he did. And as the, uh, 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 the, the uh, prophecy goes on in the remainder of that seventh chapter, it talks about the desolation that will be caused in, in that land, verse 20. The same day shall the Lord shave with a razor that is hired, namely by them beyond the river, by the king of Assyria. To shave the land like a razor, uh, desolating all that went before him. And that is the picture of what was to come to pass. And that's what did come to pass when the Assyrians came into the land to desolate the northern kingdom and to, to desolate much of the southern kingdom. Uh, he, it, it's called, in the 8th chapter, the theme is uh, uh, picked up for us when the prophet uh, uh, provides further information by the, 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 the Spirit of God working through him. When he says in verse 7, Now therefore, behold, the Lord bringeth up upon you the waters of the river, strong and many, even the king of Assyria. No doubt as to uh, what he is talking about. Uh, and all his glory, and he shall come up over the channels, and go over his banks, and he shall pass through Judah, and he shall overflow and go over. He shall reach even to the neck, and to the stretch of the wind shall he fill the breadth of thy land, O Emmanuel. Now we know that uh, Emmanuel, God with us, is a direct prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ. So now we are in a situation where although that actually happened in the days of Hezekiah, and although Hezekiah was a type of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have been pointed forward to see in this something that related to latter days, because the land is Emmanuel's. It's referred to in verse uh, uh, 10 at the end. It shall not stand for God is with us. It's a play on the names of God with us. And so, brothers and sisters, we see how that intertwined with the immediate uh, application of these words, we have hints that relate to the second coming and the things that would come to pass upon the land. And when we go into chapter 9 then and uh, pick up the tale of, uh, uh, of uh, 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 Isaiah, and see there the great encouragement that he was giving to the people of Israel who perhaps would see from afar the things that might come upon them to give them the confidence that there was an end in sight, there was a solution to these problems, there was one who would come who would defeat the Sicilian, he picks it up. When he says in verse 2 that the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light, and we know how that, that in the New Testament is applied to the preaching of the gospel, uh, 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 they that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, even uh, upon them hath the light shined. And this light is shining as a message to those uh, people, those Jews in the uh, generation to which it immediately applied. They were receiving words that would encourage them now in their view of the impending doom that would come upon the, 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 the land. And uh, the, uh, the, the light that they see is in verse 4. For thou hast broken the yoke of his burden, the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. And we'll, we'll pick up on that a, a little bit later. And the means of the deliverance was to be something that was uh, exceptional. For in verse 6, And to us a child is born, a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counsel, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the uh, increase of his government, the peace there shall be no end, and upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom, to order it and establish it with justice and judgment and with justice from hence, even from heaven. The zeal of the Lord of hosts shall perform this. And we can imagine those people having this vision put before them then, to see in the great light that was being shone into their lives in the face of the impending doom of judgment that was coming upon the land. 
And the immediate fulfillment of these things was in the case of Hezekiah, because Hezekiah himself was the uh, son of David that reigned upon the throne in Jerusalem, and it was in his days that the Assyrians were first defeated. But we see, brethren and sisters, the way that these things are always or also portend in latter day events. It's talking about the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, and in verse 7, it's talking about God's kingdom upon earth through the Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ. And so we see that uh, we are having the two parallels being put before us a prophecy that has its initial application in the days of Assyria past, but equally it will have an, a, a, an application in the days of the latter day Assyria. And if we go over to chapter 10 and chapter 11, that the picture expands, because now we're looking very much at the uh, uh, kingdom age in much of, much, much of this. We, we see there, without going through all the detail that we have here, but the essential points that are added to by the prophet when he looks at these things, uh, we, we, we see in the, uh, the, the verse 5, Assyria, the rod of mine anger, the uh, staff in their hand is mine indignation. It was God's judgments upon the people. The people were left in no doubt about that. But uh, the, uh, 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 the defeat of Assyria is predicted. In verse 12, in the second half of the, ver the verse, uh, uh, I will punish the fruit of the stout heart of the king of Assyria and the glory of his high looks. He trusted in his own strength. Hezekiah trusted in God. And that was the essential difference. And that was the faith of Hezekiah that uh, 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 prompted God's uh, relief of the uh, city of Jerusalem in that day. And we, we see how they, later on in the chapter, the remnant shall return, verse 21, even the remnant of Jacob and the, unto the mighty God. There was to be a bringing back of the people, not only out of captivity, but being brought back to the worship of the true God of Israel. And we, 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 we then reflect, as we often do upon the 11th chapter, which talks about the establishment of God's kingdom upon the earth, it talks about the uh, spirit of the Lord being upon the ruler that would rule uh, 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 there. Uh, the one who was uh, a branch shall grow to the roots of Jesse. And we see there the way in which uh, the, uh, the, uh, the perfect kingdom of God is established. But brothers and sisters, we are seeing two parallels here. We are seeing something that applies to the day. And we are seeing this wonderful vision of the latter days. It's a... Uh, interesting to note that in some, some of these uh, places there are parallels that perhaps uh, uh, suggest things to us. Verse 9. We've got there the Kalno, Karkimesh, Hemeth, Arpad, Syria and Damascus. And that was the route that the Assyrians uh, 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 moved along when they came up against the land. So that when they came to the land they were indeed a northern aggressor. They didn't come straight on a westward course across the desert lands of Iraq into Jordan, but they came uh, uh, up the following the rivers of the Tigris and Euphrates, they came northward and they came around in that way when they approached the land. And again, that points forward to us, doesn't it, to latter day uh, prophecies. So, as far as this is concerned about the judgments of God on Israel, we've seen that uh, the, uh, it was a judgment upon Israel. Uh, and Israel who needed that judgment. They needed to be a uh, return, the remnant of Jacob unto the mighty God. There was an invasion of the land that made them desolate. Captives were taken. A divine appointed king uh, saves Israel. The captives return, and there's a kingdom established upon God's principles. And that's exactly what happened in the days of Hezekiah. Hezekiah was a righteous man a man who established a kingdom according to God's principles. After the people's suffering, those events that were being prophesied by Isaiah. But surely is, there is a pattern here in future events, which we will build upon as we go through. As far as the deliverance is concerned, let's move in further on into the prophecy through Isaiah and share there the 26th and 22nd, 27th chapters which provide us with a little bit more information. We have there the, uh, a, a, a similar prediction in many ways, but uh, a little bit more information being provided to us. And some of the words here 
suggestive of future events as much as some of the words that we've already shared in the earlier prophecies are suggestive of future events. Um, it's a, 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 as a, the head in, in uh, some version, in some editions of the authorised version have it, a song inciting a, a confidence in God, but it is a, 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 against the background of the Assyrian, etc. And we have there in the uh, 17th verse of, the, of chapter 26, uh, how that the uh, people in uh, the land were in some travail. Like as a woman with child that draweth near to the time of her delivery and is in pain, crieth out in her pangs, so have we been in thy sight. It's a reflection on their situation. But out of that, they look forward to a, a time when there will be a resurgence or almost a rebirth of the people of Israel. When in verse 19, thy dead men shall live, together with my dead body shall they arise. Awake and sing, ye that dwell in dust, for thy dew is as the dew of herbs, and thy earth shall cast out the dead. And although it was a, a prediction of a resurgence of Israel in the time of Hezekiah after the Assyrians had been defeated, it has its parallel to the latter days, both in a resurgence and an establishment of God's kingdom upon the earth, and also the physical resurrection of the dead. It is a, a latter day event that is being talk, talked about here. And uh, when we go through the, the chapters, we find uh, a similar sort of things being talk, talked about in, in chapter 27. It's a, a, a added to, to this when we see prosperity for um, uh, uh, Israel, verse 6. He shall cause them that come to Judah to take root. Israel shall blossom and bud and fill the face of the world, the world with fruit. And, and we, we build it here upon the parallels that we see in the fulfilled prophecies in the days of Hezekiah and those prophecies that relate to the future, the latter day Assyria. Just one uh, additional point that we uh, glean from this chapter, it relates to the possibility of it being a year of jubilee in the time that uh, Hezekiah has uh, reigned and the defeat of the Assyrians. And in that, in verse 13 states that it shall come to pass in that day that the great trumpet shall be blown and they shall come which were ready to perish in the land of Assyria. And we know that it was the blowing of the trumpet that heralded a year of jubilee. Just as a quick aside to current day events, um, it's, it's interesting that um, the, uh, the leader of the Roman Catholic Church, the church Pope, uh, Pope, Pope Francis, announced a Catholic uh, jubilee of mercy. A extraordinary new year based upon the jubilee the the, the christian the the uh, 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 jewish jubilee and you can see the narrative there and it is in our own days it's something that is uh, there for us from december this year to november uh, next year it's just interesting that we're looking at these things in terms of latter-day events and there are things that are happening around us that do have a parallel with it what we make of that is, uh, is quite another issue. And again, others have suggested that uh, 2016 may be significant. And nobody's not <coughs> sure when the Jubilee cycles actually occur. But it does happen to be 49 years after the, uh, 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 the, 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 when Israel and uh, Jerusalem was liberated in 1967. So just as a, a quick aside, but an emphasis again on current day events the latter-day application of these prophecies to uh, the land of Israel and to the return of the Lord Jesus in our own generation. Let's move quickly on to Micah. And that chapter we shared together, the preceding chapter, which talks about very much the same things. Uh, we're very well familiar with chapter 4 because it repeats much that was in um, uh, uh, Isaiah's prophecy as well with the nations coming up to worship in, Jeru in Jerusalem. And as I already said, there was a, a, a minor fulfillment of that when, after the defeat of the Assyrians, uh, Hezekiah had nations coming up to inquire of him because of the defeat of the Assyrians by the hand of God. But we are convinced that these things have their proper fulfillment in the latter days when the Lord Jesus Christ shall return. But prior to that, there would be, in verse 9, no king in the land of uh, Israel. And 
they would be in verse 10 taken into captivity um, there shall they be delivered they, 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 they've gone to Babylon or in the context of Micah's prophecy they would be looking forward and seeing this as a prophecy concerning Assyria because Assyria were ruling over Babylon as well and that uh, we have there also the way in which there would be many nations coming up, verse 11, against the, the land, and that Israel would eventually defeat them. Verse 13, Arise and flesh, O daughter of Zion, and I will make thine horn of iron, and uh, make thy hose brass, and thou shalt beat in pieces many people, and I will consecrate their gain unto the Lord, and their substance unto the Lord of, uh, unto the, Lord of the whole, whole, whole earth. It may well have been, brothers and sisters, in the days of the Assyrians when they came up against the land, that there were other of the minor nations around them that uh, were with them, although it might not be recorded in the historical record. But be that as it may, it does project forward to the days which will come to the time that the Lord Jesus Christ shall return. And again, we have this, these two parallels of the days of Hezekiah and the days of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we've already emphasized when we go into uh, 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 the next chapter, we see there the Lord Jesus Christ specifically being referred to. The ruler that was born in Bethlehem, verse 2. The Assyrian coming into the land, uh, 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 verse, verse 5. And uh, the, uh, we don't have time to go into the detail of the prophecy, but uh, it's there uh, uh, in verse 5. We've got this curious uh, phrase. Then uh, shall we raise against him seven shepherds and eight, eight uh, principal anointed men. And without trying to think too hard about the numbers, although we might be able to, uh, it is a, 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 an emphasis of completeness and uh, extent. And it talks about how perhaps he, the, 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 the man who would be the peace would be assisted by those who had been shepherds and anointed the saints. So we can see their immediate parallels for the latter days and encouragement to those who may be shepherds and may be anointed in this, in this day and age, those who are uh, actively adhering to the word of God and are uh, 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 washed in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, reigning with the Lord Jesus Christ and having a part in the events of this coming age. Uh, it goes on to talk then about the, uh, uh, the way in which uh, Israel would be con converted and how that in verse 10, I will cut off thy horses out of the midst of thee and I will destroy thy chariots. The armaments that they would naturally refer to, those armaments that they were not supposed to have under the law of Moses, those things were to be no more and they would be forced to rely upon the Lord Jesus Christ and divine intervention. For I in verse 11, will cut off the cities of thy land, throw down thy strongholds, or all thy armaments are going to go. And their graven images will also be cut, cut, cut off. Israel will be brought to their knees, but their confidence and their own abilities will be replaced by an education in the things of God, and they will be brought back to their God. They will be cleansed from their false worship, and they would be, as Micah discloses later on in his prophecy, they would return to, to, to the land. And so we've got all of this information provided to us, and in each of these we have things that relate to latter days. So to what extent, brothers and sisters, are the things that we have, the historical events concerning Assyria in the past, going to be paralleled in the latter days? Because that's what the latter day Assyrian is all about. Before examining that any further, we, there's just one more point we want to bring out of these records. We've seen blessings that would occur in the earth, and we've seen the pictures of Isaiah and of Micah in chapter 4 of the kingdom age, the peace and God reigning. But one last prophecy, not to turn it up, but just to, to gain one bit, bit about it, because it relates to Egypt. It's a, more than uh, Assyria, although Assyria appears at the end. And it talks about Assyria, whose name is, means blessing. 
And in that day, shall Israel be the third with a Egypt and a Syria, even a blessing in the midst of the land. Whom the Lord God of hosts shall bless, saying, Blessed is be Egypt my people, and Assyria the work of my hands, and Israel mine inheritance. And so there is a further blessing that involved in the blessings of that age, Assyria will have its part. Even though it might have been the sword of God's wrath in coming against the people, even though there may be a defeat of Assyria as he oppresses the land of Israel, Assyria and the people will be blessed. They will be brought back to God and be a blessing in the land, uh, and it's on a par then with Israel and with Egypt. Let's just think and look back at the scene that we've painted. These are the things that happened in the past. To what extent then are they going to happen in the future? Israel and Judah have sinned. Yep, we've got that, haven't we? They trust in their own abilities, they don't trust in God. Assyria took Egypt into captivity. Well, they have been in captivity and have significantly returned to the land. So, is that fulfillment or is there one to come? Uh, many in Judah were captured and all but Jerusalem was taken. Well, that isn't immediately parallel at the present time. God destroys the Assyrian that comes up against the land. That certainly hasn't happened in that day, in that sense. And captives of Judah freed and being brought back, that hasn't happened. Uh, Israel and Judah experienced some time of blessing. Kings come into Jerusalem, where we apply those prophecies to the kingdom age, so that hasn't happened. But we ask the question, to what extent do these things indicate that there may be a parallel series of events in the latter days? So the latter day Assyrian. Let's just look at the prophecies. We've got them listed there, and we've got them in a little bit more detail, and it really mirrors what we've already said. We add to what we said already the fact that Israel themselves were a hypocritical nation. That's what uh, Isaiah 10 describes them as such. And we also uh, add to the, the fact that we have the uh, people of Israel being cleansed and coming back to worshipping God in truth. And we add to it the information that we gleaned from Isaiah chapter 19 that Assyria would also be a blessing. So is there compatibility of these prophecies with prophecies that we immediately associate with the, uh, the end times, the latter days? Well, the one that immediately comes to mind is Zechariah chapter 14, where the prophet is envisaging a future time when the land of Israel will be defeated by an aggressor. And it requires the Lord Jesus Christ to return, to set his feet upon the Mount of Olives, to alleviate the, 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 the people from that aggressor, and to establish his, his, his rule and to uh, release the city. But in the detail that we have in uh, that uh, uh, chapter, we have the people going into captivity. And we would think then that based upon this, that there is a parallel with the captivity of the days of Assyria in the past with something that might take place in the, in the future. And the uh, picture then is the Lord goes forth and fights against those nations as we fought in the day of battle. Which battle? Was it the Assyrian battle when the angel went out and killed 185,000? Are we being directed to see a parallel here? And so, brothers and sisters, there is a compatibility with the latter-day prophecy of Zechariah chapter 14 and the series of events that we have described for us in our very brief overview of those prophecies which can concern Israel in the past. Let's turn to Psalm 83, because Psalm 83 is another prophecy that uh, uh, we sometimes think of in latter-day events, and it has got the uh, the, 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 the attribute of not being able to be fully coordinated with any past events. It may have been in the days of when the people came over uh, against the land in the days of Jehoshaphat. It may be the time of, as has been suggested, again against the Assyrian. But we have here that there are enemies that came against the land of Israel 
and included within the enemies, we find uh, Assyria being noted. Because in verse 8 it states that Asher, Assyria, also is joined with them. So if it is the latter day, we have the latter day Assyria appearing in this chapter. And what we have, uh, you, you probably know the words very well, a confederacy of nations who are, uh, whose objective is to uh, completely obliterate Israel as from being a nation. And they said, come let us, there's four, come and let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. And we've got this confederation of people. We've got the, uh, the psalmist goes on to talk about a, a, a plea for their defeat. And the interesting part at the end then is that it should be a lesson to the peoples, to the people of Israel, and also to the peoples themselves, when the psalmist says in verse 16, fill their faces with shame, that they may seek thy name, O Lord. So it wasn't just a defeat of the people for no purpose, but it was an anxiousness on the psalmist's part that these nations would, would, would also become worshippers of the true God. If we look at the uh, nations involved, and again, this is something that is often done, uh, although there are perhaps uh, uh, uncertain things concerning the identity of some, there is no doubt it reflects the nations immediately around about the land of Israel. And the exception to this is the one that helps them, Assyria. So we've got this picture of the nations round about the land of Israel, but being helped by a more distant nation. And that's the picture that we have. And when we come to the end of the, uh, the, 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 the means of the destruction of these people, we find a correspondence with what we saw in uh, uh, Isaiah 9, and it's in Isaiah 10, of the means of destruction. Because the, uh, the, 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 the plea of the psalmist is that their nobles, verse 11, should be like Oreb and Zeb, and their princes like Zeba and Solomon and which goes back to the Midianites, verse 9, do unto them as unto the Midianites, as to Sisera. And that's exactly what the prophet Isaiah talks about concerning the destruction of the people of Assyria. So we've got a compatibility again with what we have here and what we have seen and observed in the other prophecies concerning the future of, of, of Assyria. There's also a reference in Habakkuk to the uh, means of destruction being like uh, Midian. And when we come to the end of the chapter, we see the emphasis that is placed upon the, uh, 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 the teaching here of how the, the oppressing nations should be reconciled to God. They may be ashamed forever, may be confounded and not perish, but lost is the, uh, the word that is in the original. That they may know that, uh, uh, that thou, whose name alone is Jehovah, art the most high over all the earth. And it is encouraging the Assyrians and those with them that they might come back to God. It's only incompatible with what we saw in Isaiah chapter 19. So, when are these things, how are they going to work out? And with all prophecy, brothers and sisters, we don't know. Because we don't know certainly how things will work out. Although we see the broad principles being put before us in Scripture. It is uh, the view of uh, Dr. Thomas, as he expresses in uh, Abbas Israel and Eureka, that the latter day Assyrian is, is Gog, and he may well be right. But when we look at Gog compared to what we've seen in the prophetic scriptures considering Assyria, there are a number of essential differences. And those essential differences suggest that the events of chapter 38 of Ezekiel may not be exactly the same events that we're seeing in Zechariah 14 and uh, uh, Psalm 83. It may be events of the same time period, and it may be events that uh, 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 then result in the prophecy through uh, Ezekiel 38 being uh, fulfilled, but there are, as you see on the screen there, some essential differences. So it is uh, something to ponder not to argue about the uh, interpretation of prophecy, but just to appreciate that these things could happen before Ezekiel 38. And if they happen before Ezekiel 38, then we don't have to see all the elements of Ezekiel 38 in place before the Lord's return. It may be nearer than what a, 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 a blinkered in view of that prophecy might suggest. 
But at the end of the day, brothers and sisters, there aren't any prophecies that need to be fulfilled before our Lord returns. Because he manifests himself to the saints before all of this happens. So we are just emphasizing something that we already know. The nearness of our Lord's return and the way that we need to be prepared. So as far as the lessons for us today, brethren and sisters, to this lesson, that in the comparison of the uh, Assyria of the past and the nation that they came up against, and of the situation that uh, 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 was in, in the land of that day, there is no doubt that the land, although being influenced heavily by Hezekiah and his reforms, the people, or many of them, were unaffected. And uh, much has been written on this particular topic by brethren in the past. There was this wonderful reformation, but it was ineffective as far as much of Israel was concerned. And that's why the Assyrians had to come down against the land. There were those in the land, those who were to nominally the pe people of God, who were there obeying the commandments of one who typified the Lord Jesus Christ, who did not live by God's word, contained within Isaiah 8, which we were looking at earlier on. We've got to the law and the testimony. That's what they should be looking to, and that's what they weren't doing. And we uh, referred earlier to uh, how that they were a hypocritical, a polluted nation. These things provide lessons to us, because they're warnings from the past to us. And they are types of future events. And as far as a spiritual Israel is concerned, or us as individuals in the community, is it a case that there are parallels that might exercise our minds? that we can learn from these events, although the prophecies might not directly relate to us, how, how, how that we are, in a sense, besieged by an oppressor. The materialism and the neglect of God around us, the confidence in the oppressor in their own ability, as opposed to the confidence that we should have in God, is the, uh, one of the distinguishing features between us. And that is something that is all around us and would take us into captivity, that we might live within the lands of Assyria and have exactly the same ways of life and mindsets that they had. And yet, when that uh, oppression seems to be at its height, there is relief. The Lord Jesus Christ, or in the case of uh, in Hezekiah's day, the angel comes, and there is liberty to the captives. Those who have been taken captives are going to return, and they uh, uh, share in great blessings of that day, great plenty, great peace, wonderful rulership of that day. It's a warning, brothers and sisters, but it's also a great uh, 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 comfort to us that in the same way that it happened for Hezekiah and the people of Israel at that time, it will happen for us at the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the warning, the other side of that coming is, are we a hypocritical nation? Is our uh, 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 worship and our attitudes towards God according to the law and the testimony? Do we refer to his word for everything we do, say or think in our lives? And is that the direction of our words that is wholly uh, uh, adhered to? Is that our genuine attempt? And so brothers and sisters, there are challenges for us that we need to face up to in order to prepare ourselves for the return of the Lord. And even in future events in the nations around us, we see that uh, the latter-day Assyria, who is it? It could, as Dr. Thomas thought, be Russia. It might not be Russia. It could be Iran, because that's the same geographical area that we have. But whoever it is, brothers and sisters, it doesn't much matter, because we know that these things will come. The people who were brought back to God, it would be very fitting if they were uh, 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 the people of Islam, who already were believe in a one true God and have a great religious further. But we don't know whether these things will be. But we open our minds to them in an attempt to make ourselves ready for the day of the Lord's return. Because the question is, are we ready? Whenever, whoever the latter-day Assyrian is, whenever the trial for Israel will come, that's the one key question. Will we be ready? Because when it does come, the Lord Jesus Christ will have already returned to the earth and we will have been brought before his judgment seat.